Hi everybody, I'm Don Dixon. I want to thank you for joining me today. Uh, I had a question this week from one of my subscribers and it involved mapping and interpretation. And it also brought about a continuation of what we've been talking about. So I wanted to uh, start today by uh, answering his question and hopefully uh, it'll answer some questions for you. Okay, everybody, uh, I'm going to read this first question from a subscriber this morning, actually, after I put my cheaters on, <laughs> so I can read it, uh, because it brings up a point <clears throat> which I've, I've had two or three just this week, other questions that sort of are just like this question. It deals with the potential of suspended fish and how our structure fishing message uh, will apply to suspended fish, especially suspended fish that are suspending vertically. So I'm going to be dealing with that today based on this guy's question. We'll get some of those answers and I'll tell you how that we're going to uh, beat this situation and always be successful and what our keys are. So let me read this from a subscriber. Uh, let me see, what the heck's his name? Earl. Earl. Okay, Earl Luce writes, and he says, Hope you're feeling better every day, which I am, by the way. I'll throw that in. He said he has a quick question for me. He received a seven-pack of spoon plugs. Good, and I have a seven-pack right here beside me today. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And he said, I can't wait to use them. My question is, how would you go about fishing for walleyes, which are suspended, like in Lake Erie, question. I fished with some guys last year that invited me to go with them. I don't know whether they were guides or whether they were just people who live in the area and fish it regularly, but he wrote that he went fishing with these guys out of Ohio and the fish were down 30 feet in 75 feet of water. In other words, they were suspended vertically. He goes on to say the boat ride was terrible I put in parentheses, he has almost puked. <laughs> but we boated 22 walleyes in just a few hours of fishing. And he explained they were using these spinners in the worm harness, in dip sea divers, etc., etc., etc. And he said, when the fish hit, they grabbed the poles and fought the fish for a minute, then handed me the rod to finish bringing in the fish. He said, I don't need to go back. I really don't think I want to try it with my 14-foot boat, which brings out another question, by the way. Uh, but what would go with someone with a bigger boat, maybe, where I could try spoon plugging? For those of you who have been following me, you already know that we really zero in on a regular basis that when fishing deeper than 10 feet, we have our lures on the bottom. Talk about it all the time. Most importantly, for the largemouth bass, and all the basses actually, but also included in that discussion is a walleye, a northern pike, and a muskie. I want my lures on the bottom for a reason. In most all fishing situations, Fish will be moving and following along bottom features in a lake or, and or a reservoir or a river as they're making a movement, whether it be a seasonal movement or a daily movement. So naturally, if they're following a bottom feature, I want my lures on the bottom, period. And a lure that's actually bumping along the bottom like we preach about the spoon plugs, that's a quadruple attractor to a fish. Not only are they getting the vibrations through their lateral lines on the movements of the lure based on its design, but they're getting it when it's bouncing against the bottom. I think I brought out in a video that Buck had a friend who was a, a professor at University of Georgia, an audio professor of some sort, and he did this test on a bunch of different lures. And when he got to the spoon plug, he talked about all the other lures, how, they, how much sound they were vibrating out that the fish could, you know, help to locate the bait. And he said, when I got to the spoon plug and got the spoon plug bumping the bottom, he said it sounded like a freight train. 
That's an important thing. So we stress, when you're fishing for that school of big fish, they're deeper than 10 feet. You want your lure bumping the bottom. Always. And then all of a sudden I get a question like this. Wait a minute, we were in 75 feet of water catching walleyes 30 feet. What happened? Here's what's happened. And then there's an answer to it that will allow you and I to always go out and be successful. Regardless of the fishing situation, regardless of the species, regardless of the time of the year. We know what we're doing. We know where we're going. We have a plan. And if it involves what this guy ran into, we've got the answer. So here we go. And I'm going to show you a map of Lake Erie. And we're going to break it down a little bit for you. Uh, because the lake needs to have a separation point of how you and I might go fish a certain area of Lake Erie because it's so big. It's like you're talking about the ocean. And there's different situations. I'm going to start right now in the western uh, basin of Lake Erie. You got the feeder streams and you got the Detroit River where the fish spawn and all that, but as they start moving after the spawn, moving into that western basin, there's an area, and this is what I'm showing you right here on the map, it's called the Bass Islands. People just say I was fishing around the Bass Islands. And there's three major big islands there. And like in most all fishing, as we've talked about in our study on structure, when you have above water islands, you will always have underneath water islands in the same area. So I'm going to blow this picture up a little bit and show you what's down there a little bit better around these Bass Islands. As you can see, there's structure everywhere. As we look at this western basin structure and so on and so forth, how would we fish it? I would fish it the same way I fish any other lake or a reservoir because I have typical structures that I can identify and you can even identify them on the map. Now mind you, like we talked about last week, you can't identify from that map the exact spot on those structures. But we can identify the structure, go to it, do our detailed map, and we have our answer. We'll be in a casting position for those rascals. Now, but let's move on now. Keep in mind, a lot of these fish that are in the western basin aren't staying there. They're seasonal migrators. They'll be moving further down into the central basin. And I'm going to blow up this map to show you just how far that is in distance. We're talking about this is an ocean out there now. And I'm going to talk about different way of fishing, different way of identifying where we're going to fish, how we're going to fish, if we're in the central basin, or if we're over in the eastern basin, which is where I normally fish for my smallmouth when I make my fall smallmouth trip to Erie. But today we're talking about some suspended fish. So let's get on to it. Uh, as I show you this full length picture of Lake Erie and you're looking at the central basin and the eastern basin, you don't see any of those islands, any of those humps or reefs or, or, or bars. You don't see the typical stuff. Sure, along the shoreline here, you can see some little shallow bars, you know. Most of that stuff, the deepest those bars are, pretty much is 25 feet along the shoreline. Now, one of the things that really changes stuff up just a little bit is the water color in Lake Erie. That water is like fishing in water out of your tap. I mean, it's more clear than clear. So I don't know how else to say it. And as you know, the one thing that fish have a problem with is light. The brighter the conditions, the deeper the fish. It's that simple. So when you have extreme clear water, you know you're going to have deep fish. If you look at the map, which I'm showing you, you got to go pretty far out to get what I would consider from the summertime standpoint. You have to go pretty far out to get to the sanctuary zone areas of depth. And in Erie, 
60 feet, 75 feet, 90 feet. You're going to have a lot of fish spending a lot of <laughs> their lifetime in water that deep. And it's simply brought about by the clarity of the water. Which reminds me, if you don't have my Daily Guide to Fishing Success ebook, please get one. This will explain a lot of things to you, but in our general interpretation, let's interpret. If we're going to fish the central basin or the eastern basin where you're going to have most of your fish most of the season, most all of your big schools of big fish, even though they're going to be everywhere, there's going to be a ton of them in that central and eastern basin. But I can't see any structure that's anywhere close to a sanctuary zone area of depth. All right, so let's do a general interpretation on Lake Erie. You know what it is? It's a Florida-type lake. <laughs> it's as big as an ocean. The Great Lakes, how that glacier came and pushed and drove that thing and cut that thing out, it's just a big saucer-type lake. Just like we were talking about my grandson going out there uh, and fishing one-sided brake lines, catching bass in Florida. Florida-type lake. Lake Erie, Florida-type lake, only big as the ocean. So as we do our general interpretation, there's no structure you and I can identify by looking at this map that's close to what we would consider a, a relatively uh, decent sanctuary zone in extremely clear water. So what's our key going to be? It's going to be just like fishing a Florida-type lake. Now, this guy's question points out something, like I say, is a little bit different. When we talk about fishing on the bottom deeper than 10 feet, I'm talking about 98% of the time. But we can throw a, the Great Lakes in, we can throw situations like this in where the fish are so far removed from a shoreline bar, a shoreline related structure, that all of a sudden when the weather becomes good and they can become active, which they do at least twice a day, they become active, they can move, but they're not going to move eight miles to come into a shoreline related structure. What they're going to do during activity is to suspend vertically to a depth that the weather will allow. Now this writer who wrote in, this subscriber, he didn't realize catching fish at 30 feet in Lake Erie, that's, that's pretty good movement. <laughs> you know, in most fishing guys would say, my, wow, 30 feet, you're catching fish at 30 feet, that's pretty deep. That's a good movement in Lake Erie in the summer months, 30 feet, 25, 30 feet, good stuff. But it's going to be out there in relationship to that sanctuary zone. They're not going to swim 10 miles to get 10 feet shallower or 20 feet shallower, they're not going to do it. They're going to just suspend vertically, which they do. This isn't something that I think they do. This is something they do. Now, as structure fishermen, how are we going to plan our fishing trip? How are we going to locate these fish? Now, if I have suspended walleyes, in 75 feet of water, let's say you're out there wherever you are, five miles out, six miles out, and you know the fish aren't moving in, they're going to move up to get shallower at activity period. How am I going to fish that rascal? What am I looking for? I'm looking for the exact same thing I'm looking for in Florida. So as we flip back to the walleyes, and I know that they're five miles out, they're seven miles out, they're ten miles out in 75 feet of water, maybe six miles, whatever it is. You're way out there. We know those fish aren't going to move towards the bank at activity. They're going to suspend vertically. Now, how am I going to find these fish? Keep in mind now, that's an ocean out there. When you're actually standing on the shoreline looking out there, you can't see anything on the other side or east or west. It's huge water. So where am I going to find my fish? I know it's going to be a one-sided break line. And when I find a break line, I'm going to follow that break line like I would 
here in Florida or any other place I'm following a brake line to do a channel in a, in a flatland reservoir, I'm going to follow that brake line. And if I have my depth sounder on, when my unit's on, I'm following this brake line. If there is an activity period, those suspended fish are going to show. I'm going to run right over their heads. And then I'm in business. I've got suspended walleye that are relating to a bottom feature, which most people don't recognize. But we were looking for it when we went out there. We knew what we were looking for. We were looking for a brake line. Once we found it, we started following it. Now, at, at time of activity, we don't know if those fish are going to move to 15 feet. We don't know if they're going to move to 30 feet like they did in, in, in uh, Earl's uh, uh, email. We don't know if they're going to move to 40 feet from 75. We don't know what the depth is, where they're going to end up, where this activity will sort of peter out. In his case, it was 30 feet. So now, here comes the main question. How are you and I, structure fishermen, going to take advantage of this situation? We know what we're looking for. We find it. We find a brake line. We're following it. Doesn't matter if it's 75 feet. Could be 60 feet. And the fish are suspended at 17 feet of water over 60 foot. We don't care. What we need to find is the brake line. And then we're following and we'll let the activity and the weather and everything else determine how shallow those fish become at activity. You might recall when I started doing these vlogs a couple of years ago, in all my blogs on my uh, webpage, I've talked many times about how once you're grounded in Buck Perry's information, you can go to any body of water, any lake, reservoir, river, Great Lakes, you can go to the ocean, you can go anywhere you want to go and be successful regardless of species, regardless of time of the year. You can just go anywhere and be successful all the time. So when it comes to something a little bit different, people want to change their thinking. Well, we go to Lake Erie, it's loaded with walleye, so we just go helter-skelter out there and we'll catch fish because there's so many fish. And in some cases, that's happening. <laughs> but if you want to consistently have success, you have to use structure as your guide as to where the fish are going to be. Well, where is the structure in the Great Lakes? For the most part, with a few exceptions, like over at the Bass Islands, but the rest of the entire Lake Erie, is just like our lakes in Florida. Saucer-type lakes, and our key is one-sided bars. We find a brake line, we follow it, and when there's a change in direction, normally there's your fish. We're looking for a break on that brake line. But in many cases, when you're following those big old brake lines out in the Great Lakes, uh, when those fish become active and move, they're going to light up your screen. But it wasn't by accident. It's because you found the brake line and you were fishing the brake line. You were using structure as your guide as to where you're going to find your suspended fish. Okay, let's say we're on our brake line. We're back with our walleyes and, and the screen lights up and our fish are there. And we said it's not by accident. Uh, we found those fish by looking for our structure. And even though they're suspended, they were related to a bottom feature. In 99.9% .9 of the time in the Great Lakes, that is a break line where we have a rather sudden increase in depth. Okay? Now, with seven different sizes of lures and two different types of line on my two trolling rods, one with wire, one with, with the Nobo, I can fish from zero to 60 feet effectively. You tell me the fish are in 37 feet, short line 700 on wire, relatively short line. Let's say you got the fish are at, very active at 45 feet. I can do it with a 700 or I can do it with an 800, a shorter line length with 800 on wire line. Two trolling rods, seven types of lures. I can fish any depth. 
let's say those fish come to 15 feet, 100 on, on the no bow trolling line on the regular monofilament, or a short line 250 on wire. Let's say the fish are at 27 feet. It's a little bit deeper than my 800 on, on the monofilament, but 27 feet I can get easily with a 200 on wire. And I'm controlling my exact depths with the line length. See, this runs to 12 feet maximum, 9 to 12 feet, on no bow line. If I put it on wire with the same amount of line length, I can effectively double the depth, 24 feet. By adding another two layers of line, I'm at 27 feet. 200 on wire. So by adjusting my line lengths with my lure sizes and my knowledge of the lure sizes with the two different types of line, I can fish literally any depth those fish are. By simply unsnapping one and snapping another one on the snap and letting my line out and going fishing. So there's nothing easier than this. Once we use our structure as our guide and we're fishing where we expect to find the fish and they become active no matter where they decide to stop and that'll be based on that weather and water conditions at that time at how deep they are. We have the right lure put on one of these two rods that run right through that school of fish. I hope that answers Earl's question. Uh, and let me suggest, I know it's, it's a fishery that y'all aren't all fishing. And it is a little bit different with the suspended walleye, which 99% of the time they don't do. They're on the bottom 99% of the time in a normal lake reservoir. But in Lake Erie, when their sanctuary is six or eight miles out, they're not coming in to any shoreline-related structure. They're going to suspend vertically. So only one other thing that you need to consider, and I'll mention it. It's the ocean. And it was, it was really the main reason back in the day, back in uh, the late 80s and early 90s, that we built a little bigger version of my boat. And let me show you a picture of it. It was 10 inches wider than the original boat. It was another foot longer. Uh, and it was deeper. So it took the water a little bit better. And the day I tested it, I tested it on Lake Erie in six foot waves. <laughs> and it did a great job. And I knew that we had we'd come up with a big water boat, so to speak, big for us. And I was running it with a 60 horse tiller handle. Beautiful. But you need to be safe, number one. <laughs> number two, take advantage of one of the greatest fisheries that exists today, if you're anywhere close. So at any rate, Thanks for being with me today, and I want to uh, uh, encourage you to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel and all and the vlogs that we're doing, do that today. We're, we're looking to get as many subscribers as we can to share the word when it comes to the truth about catching fish. So at any rate, thanks again for being with me today, and we'll see you the next time.